Klein have been able to join us. Uh, in the room here, we have our speakers and a small selection of our faculty. Um, I just want to note that I know we were hoping that this was going to be more of a hybrid event where um, more participants would be able to join in person, but unfortunately, due to the current conditions, we were not able to do that. But we do hope in the future to be able to do more in-person or hybrid events. Um, I'm going to get started with some housekeeping slides and then introduce our speakers and get this discussion going. Um, this uh, tonight is a mini symposium with the focus on managing side effects of cancer therapy. Um, this is part of a mini, mini symposium series uh, directed by myself and Dr. Vered Stearns, the leader of our breast uh, women's malignancies program here at Johns Hopkins. Um, and this event was also planned by Jackie Bacon and Elizabeth Saylor. Um, we have uh, three speakers uh, tonight, uh, Dr. Dawn Hirschman and Dr. Kimberly Lee. And we will also be hearing from Melissa Preston Wesby, a patient, about her personal experiences. So just a little bit of housekeeping. We will start by a presentation by Dr. Don Hirschman, which will be approximately 30 minutes. And that will be followed by a presentation by Dr. Kimberly Lee, which will be approximately 20 minutes. Um, and then uh, Elizabeth Saylor, our navigator, will be introducing Melissa Preston Wesby and Melissa will be sharing her experience. Uh, after that, we will open the floor up for discussion, and we're hoping that you guys will have lots of questions. It will be a live question and answer session. Um, as a participant, if you've joined us by Zoom, you will be muted during the webinar, and the best way for you to communicate your questions is to put them in the chat box or to use the Q&A function. What I will be doing is uh, following along with those questions, and when it times, comes time for the question and answer session, I will select from the questions and pose them to our speakers and hopefully we'll have a nice discussion. Once the webinar has uh, been finished, you will immediately receive a link to complete an evaluation. It will be really brief, less than five minutes. We really hope that you're able to do this for us. Your responses will be used to guide our future educational activities and other programs. Um, there will be no personal information collected. If you don't complete it immediately, you will get a follow-up email asking you to do this, and we're really hopeful that you can do this within seven days. Uh, we really need your feedback to plan for future programs and new initiatives. Uh, thank you. Uh, we will be moving on now. I'm going to introduce our first speaker. The first speaker is Dr. Dawn Hirschman. She uh, comes to us from Columbia in uh, New York City, where she is a professor of medicine and epidemiology uh, with tenure. She completed her uh, training uh, also at Columbia for the School of Public Health and also as a fellow in uh, hematology and medical oncology followed by epidemiology, biostatistics, environmental sciences, um, and also her medicine residency at Columbia. She um, has over 500 publications, many of which have focused on adherence to cancer therapy and issues related to side effects. And we're excited to hear from her. Thank you, Dr. Hirschman. Okay, so if you give us a moment to switch slide sets, let's see. Um, just close it because I don't know if it's going. I should. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I'll just, just close this. Uh, yeah. You want to just click the um, slideshow at the top of the screen? There you go. Thank you so much for inviting me today uh, to speak to you all. Um, I, if any of my slides seem overwhelming, don't worry about it. I'm really just going to tell a story. So um, uh, that's sort of my goal today. And I'm going to be talking about really, I'm really going to be focusing on side effects of endocrine therapy. Um, there are so many things one could discuss, but to hone it down to 30 minutes, I figured it would be best to talk about uh, endocrine therapy side effects. And in breast cancer, we know that, uh, you know, over two thirds of all breast cancers are sensitive to um, endocrine therapy. And there are a whole variety of reasons why, why women take them. We, we first realized that they reduced the risk that breast cancer would come back in women with invas invasive cancer. And they're pills that you need to take for a substantial number of time. We we gave them for five years. Now we now we give them for ten years. So it's something you need to take uh, over a long period of time. 
Um, we know that it, they're given to both women who have been through menopause and to premenopausal women. And sometimes we even suppress women's ovarian function to give these medications. Um, not only are they used for invasive breast cancer, they're used for uh, DCIS, they're used to prevent breast cancer, and really importantly, they're used for women with advanced breast cancer, stage four. And as we have gotten better and better at treating metastatic breast cancer in this setting, women can be on these medications for years and years as well. Uh, so it covers a huge number of uh, indications and for a long duration of time. But we know for sure that medications don't work in people that don't take them. So in order to achieve all of the substantial benefits that uh, have come from years and years in, of research, we need to make sure that uh, patients have access uh, and they take these medications. But what we've learned uh, in addition to, you know, the, how effective these therapies are is that they're difficult to take. And one of the first studies that came out was by Ann Partridge, you know, in 2003, so 20 years ago, that was a very small study looking at women on tamoxifen. And she used Medicaid data and found that, you know, by year four, only 50% of patients were still taking their medication, uh, which was pretty shocking. So um, simultaneously, uh, we had been looking at some of the same things. And we had the opportunity to look at um, patients in Kaiser, so 8,000 patients, to sort of uh, simultaneously confirm these findings. And what we found was that about a quarter of all women stopped taking their medication by year five. And by, um, by year five, about an additional quarter of people that were taking their medicine were only taking it intermittently, less than 80% of the time. So again, sort of reiterating that same finding that only 50% of women were taking these medications for the full uh, amount of time and for more than 80% of the, um, the, uh, the um, recommended amount. Um, so the next question was, well, is that meaningful? Does it matter if you stop early? Does it matter if you take it intermittently? And, uh, you know, from this data, we found that women that took it less, they didn't survive as long, whether or not you stopped early or you took it intermittently. And there was sort of a dose response. So the less you took it, the more likely your cancer was to come back. Now, whenever you do these kinds of studies, it's always good to be self-reflective because there may be other things that are going on, it may not just be directly causal in that stopping the medicine is the only reason why the cancer came back. But since this data, multiple investigators have repeated similar analyses, looking at clinical trials data, looking at all different types of data sources and have found the same thing. Stop taking your medicine, restarting it makes difference. So it's not fate, right? So you can always make a difference. You can always make a change. And this study looked at people that stopped completely versus those that stopped and restarted and found that restart encouraging for those of us and um community because it means that asking and doing something about it can make a difference. So um, it's really important to understand these things. So when you when you start to take a step back and say, okay, well, why do people a whole host of reasons, right? And all of them have been studied. Uh, sometimes they cost too much. Sometimes there are too many of them. You're taking too many pills. Sometimes you forget some people have beliefs about medications, about them poisoning their body, and maybe that's something why most people stop taking their medication is because of side effects or fear of side effects. So, uh, 
want to achieve the, the best benefit for our patients, we have to not only know what to give, we have to figure out how to get it to people so that they can tolerate it. So here we see this complex figure that is in, you know, we can see you have this treatment that you know works and you want to have the best outcome possible in terms of living longer and having good quality of life. But um, in order to do that, you have to be able to have managed symptoms. So you have to recognize when people have symptoms, which means you have to ask or you have to be alerted that somebody's having a problem. So you need to know how to manage it, how to uh, um, measure it, and then you have to know how to manage it. And you have to address all the reasons that could interfere with a patient getting that medication. So when you think about endocrine therapy and toxicity, you know, therapy for breast cancer are overlapping side effects. You might see a little bit more in terms of vasomotor symptoms, like hot flashes with tamoxifen, beto. Um, vaginal dryness, vaginal bleeding, and thromboembolic disorders with your own hot flashes, bone loss, depression. Uh, but really, all of these things can happen with both. So I put up this chart, um, really not because I expect anybody to look at any of these numbers because they're irrelevant, um, but to say, you know, the point is that when we find things out from clinical trials, they're not always measured or, or conveyed in ways that are meaningful to patients. And this is a trial that um, looked at premenopausal women and turning off their ovaries and giving endocrine therapy, something that is very effective for, uh, for reducing the risk that breast cancer comes back. And the side effects were sort of said to be about the same, maybe a little bit worse if you suppress patients' uh, ovaries. But I just want you to look at any adverse event. 95% in tamoxifen, 98.7% in the other two arms. Everybody had side effects. So there wasn't a big difference because everybody had them. And when you start to really hone down on the way clinical trials are reported, it's really important to look at what they're reporting. So often what's done is done based on therapeutic trials like chemotherapy, um, especially in patients with advanced disease where they're looking at, does this side effect cause you know, a grade three or four toxicity? We'll put that into perspective. Grade three is something that requires intervention and, and interacts um, us with their activities of daily living. So that's a severe, side effect, like just a step before being hospitalized. And grade four is life-threatening. So often when we think of like endocrine therapies, they don't hit this mark, but they can be really debilitating. So even in this study of suppressing patients' ovarian function and giving an aromatase inhibitor or just giving tamoxifen, a quarter to a third of patients had grade three or four toxicities. That's really severe. And most people are bothered by grade one side effects because this isn't for a week or two or a month or two. This is for five or 10 years. And so we need to think about how we ask these questions and what's meaningful in terms of clinical trial results and what's meaningful to patients. So people have looked at ways of trying to manage these side effects. And this, I like this wheel because it's sort of pretty, but the reality is these are the most common side effects that you see with endocrine therapy, joint pain, sexual dysfunction, hot flashes, fatigue, and weight gain. And there have been a whole variety of clinical trials that have been done to try to intervene, to make these side effects better. But the problem is very few of them are high quality um, or can be interpreted. We're gonna talk about some of them today. Um, Lots of different things have been investigated. Um, there's always ongoing investigations, but as we discussed the different studies, the few studies I've picked because um, I had to select, 
I think it's also to keep in, important to keep in mind, it's not just whether a study worked or didn't work. It's really about all of the other factors that go into a clinical trial and how you interpret those results. And it's important to pay attention, even if you're not a scientist, because we know how we design trials and how um, uh, uh, we do interventions can influence the reporting of those outcomes. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is works. So um, just as I mentioned, when you go back to these big clinical trials, you look to say, how was it reported in terms of the trials? Like when, when we first started giving these medications as opposed to tamoxifen, they were reported in trials as being, yeah, there were some mild differences in, in our trousers and or, or it wasn't really reported at all. Because if you don't ask, you don't find out. And if you're not aware of it's a side effect, people often don't volunteer that information because people always have joint pain and it's not always associated with the drug or it wasn't a little bit initially. So the, all of the initial clinical trials either reported no difference or very small differences between uh, the groups in terms of, of, of arthralgias. But we did a study where we asked people. So this was sort of at the beginning of patient reported outcomes and asking people about their symptoms because those side effects that were reported were reported by providers. They were reported by physicians remembering whether or not a patient had to come. You know, when we first started giving medicine and that was their joint symptoms these medicines came reported stiffness it either got worse when they started taking the medications or it started after taking the medicines so wildly different than what we would expect from the clinical trials where patients weren't asked themselves so the message is if you want to know you have to ask patients about their side effects What are the of this trials where they look like patients stopped taking their medicines, became non-adherent with the arthralgias. Um, for people stop taking their medicines together. So knowing, you know, these things is important. So there have been a variety of effects. Um, and one study, and one study that, that I was involved in by Melinda Erwin asked about exercise. We know exercise is important for a whole variety of reasons, but this study asked about, you know, exercise and they compared it to not doing anything, what they what we call usual care. Um, but everybody knew that they were part of this uh, uh, with supervised weight training. So they had, um, uh, you know, a, a personal trainer, essentially. And so what were the results? Well, looking over the course of a year, you know, what are these numbers? Me. Well, in the patients that were randomized to the exercise arm, their patient, their their pain scores in terms of their joint pain. So, um, so that's great because there's no, no harm in telling people to exercise. So um, this is a study that we did looking at omega-3 fatty acids. And the reason we chose omega-3 
patients told us they were taking it and that it improved it to a placebo. Everybody was taking something, and presumably people didn't know what they, which arm they were on. Um, but um, uh, you know, it's a completely different. So here you look at the omega three, and you think, oh, huge success, right? It's just about as good as exercise. It's not better. Like at 24 weeks, it was even better, right? Until you look at the placebo arm, <laughs> and then you say, like, well, why is that? Why do you see this effect and pick out worse? You know, so it shows you that in these studies and what you choose to be your group, you should get a placebo. On these results, because the placebo here was better than the exercise in the prior study. So here's a third approach: uh, duloxetine. So duloxetine is Cymbalta, and it's a prescription medication. So it's not a supplement; it's not a behavioral intervention, and it's known to improve pain. It also improves mood. And here's a study that where it's compared to placebo. And the details of this were really just that, you know, ramped up and people were on it. But what's really important is that the study measured after patients stopped taking the, the drug. You never know what happened afterwards with that study. And Basically, you can see similar. To the omega three. You see that twelve week point when that study was complete or twenty five percent reduction in placebo effect is going to be which is really that reduction you see in that placebo arm. But what's important about this study is that they looked when people came off. And whether you came off a placebo or you came off the intervention drug, they came together at the end. They both were better than when they started. Um, but that intervention effect didn't last. So. What's the take home message to a patient? You have to be on this medicine forever, or you can, you know, you can stop and do um, better than when you started. So it's a little bit tricky. So finally, I want to talk about a third type of intervention. And this is a study we did that looked at acupuncture. So to try to overcome some of those design issues in the past, we randomized women to getting acupuncture wait list, sort of similar so that there would be some potential placebo effect, um, knowing that maybe we wouldn't have to deal with some of the biases of knowing that you were waiting for an intervention. And we measured people a lot longer than the intervention itself. So what did we see with this intervention? Well, patients at, at the primary endpoint of six weeks, 60% reduction meaningful reduction, meaning they had like a 20% reduction uh, if they got true acupuncture and only placebo effect, but it was better in the acupuncture group. But what was really important is that this intervention lasted. And this is a slide of 24 weeks, but we've looked at 52 weeks and you can see that, that that's beneficial. So here you have an intervention that you know appears to work, doesn't have a lot of side effects, and the effect seems to last even after you give it um, for a short period of time. But there are multiple other barriers, like it's expensive and not always covered by insurance. But we'll help guide us. 
So maybe if we can find the right intervention for the right person, we can say to them, well, we know these four different things might work and they might work differently for one person versus another, but try it rather than coming off your medicine. Uh, and maybe we can find something that'll keep somebody on their medicine. So the second most common side effect is hot flashes. And here again, multiple studies have been done looking at interventions for uh, 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 hot flashes. And when these studies were done, on, um, for four weeks and um, ask people once a week whether or not their hot flashes were, were better or, or worse. Um, and so multiple, multiple studies were done like this compared to placebo sometimes, sometimes not. And this is a, a compilation of all of them. And you can see that similar placebo effect. These are all drugs that are either antidepressants or some type of pharmacologic intervention. And these are all supplements. Now, the supplements are all pretty similar to placebo, but they all sort of work uh, the same way. Um, so these are all uh, considered negative studies, but um, all had some effect. So you could say, okay, well, if there are all these things that sort of work a little bit, what where do I start and, you know, does it matter? So I'm showing you this study just to show you that it, it doesn't really matter. So this is a study where they took two drugs that seemed to work and patients got one or the other, then they had a washout and they switched to the one that they weren't on. Um, and to see if, you know, one is better than another. And what was interesting, you can see these two lines sort of show this overlap. And when people were on the drug, no matter what drug they were on, they got better. When they went into the washout, they got a little bit worse. And when they switched, they got better again. So, you know, that being said, it then comes down to what side effects are associated with the intervention how accessible that intervention is, what patients are willing to tolerate, how expensive it is. But you can sort of have some general belief that no matter what you do, if that doesn't work, you can maybe try something else. So lastly, I wanna talk a little bit about vaginal dryness and sexual dysfunction because um, that was uh, also on that list as a, as a very, very common uh, debilitating side effect. And the first study that was done um, that I could see in terms of a randomized study just looked at giving um, some type of vaginal moisturizer. Um, again, they had that similar design where they gave either Replens, which is a um, you know, which is a vaginal mo moisturizer versus placebo, um, and then they did a washout, um, and then they gave it again, and. You can see during the period when there is a washout, um, the patients actually in the placebo got worse and the patients in the replens continued to get better. So it's a little bit baffling, uh, but overall uh, there's a difference in that the patients on the replens did a little bit better. But how you design these studies and what you choose as the outcome measure can affect uh, the results that you get. So replens is an option. It seems to work a little bit. Well, what's another option? Well, another option is vaginal estrogen. Now, that's something that's been looked at, uh, you know, in many, many, many different studies in the literature um, in terms of patients that are in menopause and been shown to improve, uh, you know, vaginal dryness and um, uh, pain and intercourse. And it's relatively safe if you're giving tamoxifen because tamoxifen doesn't lower your estrogen. But what if you're taking a medicine where the whole goal is to lower your estrogen level, like an aromatase inhibitor or blocking your ovarian function? Is it safe to give these medicines that 
have the estrogen in them when your whole goal is to lower estrogen? Well, there's not a whole lot of literature on that, surprisingly. This is one study that was done where they actually measured what patient's estradiol level was before and after. And for the most part, it didn't, for most women, it didn't change whether their pre, what we call pre-insertion level was the same as their level at 30 days and 60 days. And when you look at the overall result, it shows no difference. But there was So well, did we always have to be a little bit skeptical. So this is another study. And again, these, this slide is super hard to read, and it's not meant for anybody to read the details. It's really just to remind me of what the take-home message is. <laughs> and the take-home message of this study was they looked at vaginal estrogens and they looked at vaginal moisturizer to see if there was a difference. Because from that prior study, it's just an N of one, so to speak. People are compared to themselves. And in this study, there was really no difference uh, in terms of um, the estradiol levels between changes, whether it was estradiol, estrone, FSH, LH, all of these are different ways of measuring different hormones in your body. There was no difference between people that got topical estrogen and those that got vaginal moisturizer. Um, and uh, no matter, and there was no difference between the type of uh, topical estrogen that you got. Now, this should be interpreted with caution because these are very small numbers, but it gives us some sense that you need some kind of control. But what was important is that the, um, there is a real difference in terms of sexual side effects, vaginal dryness in those that got the estrogen therapy compared to those that got vaginal moisturizer. So it's a much more effective therapy. So we need to do better. Other options. Well, one other option is um, for, especially for, for patients with significant amount of pain, is uh, aqueous uh, vaginal lidocaine. Um, and this is a study that compared um, uh, topical lidocaine um, versus saline. And at baseline, uh, there was really no difference between the group uh, when the patients were uh, blinded at four weeks, the uh, patients that were getting lidocaine had a significant improvement in pain compared to those that did not. And when everybody got it, um, the, uh, which is that last curve, they all did better. So a suggestion that this may be a reasonable approach. And then finally, there's a lot of interest in um, CO2 laser therapy. Um, and the, what CO2 laser therapy does is it helps rebuild um, the, the vasculature and the vagina to improve um, uh, some of these symptoms. And this is, um, you know, a small study in terms of looking at the effect of um, uh, the CO2 laser therapy in terms of as you start to get this, after you get this therapy, uh, the scores on sexual function improve and the scores on distress decrease um, over the course of time. Uh, so there's some suggestion that this type of therapy may improve symptoms, but it's really important to do big studies because what happened was these studies started to come out in the literature and then all of a sudden there were all of these reports to the FDA um, that uh, there was like scarring and other types of toxic um, effects. And sometimes the, um, the, the same criteria that we use for devices in terms of approval is very different than what we use for drugs. 
And so um, they halted use of these uh, devices until more studies uh, were done. So it's always important um, to, to um, make sure that there's adequate literature or understanding of how good something is before you actually get it. So just to conclude, um, I really want to convey that when the, one of the reasons we do symptom management is to improve the quality of life of patients, but it also bigger picture is to try to make sure that patients can get the medications that we know work to improve outcomes. And when we think of interventions to do, we need to think of the things that people are going to tolerate. Because if the medication or intervention that we give is worse, <laughs> causes side effects that are worse than the actual um, medication that we initially intended, that's no good. And if it's something that somebody needs to be on for a long, long period of time, we need to make sure that those interventions are, are, um, are tolerable. We really need, when we disseminate this intervention works versus that intervention, we really need to do a deeper dive because you always have to be skeptical and look at control and some So you need to look at the primary outcome. It has the potential to be disseminated, and you have to open this up to questions after afterwards. So I'll hand this over to Dr. Lee. So uh, while Dr. Lee is getting situated, um, I'll just briefly introduce her. Thanks so much, Dr. Hirschman, for a great discussion. Uh, Dr. Lee is coming to us from Florida. She's an assistant member in the Departments of Breast Oncology and Health Outcomes and Behavior at Moffitt Cancer Center and an assistant professor in the Morsani College of Medicine at the University of South Florida. Um, although she's coming now from Florida, she's actually quite well known to us here at Hopkins. Uh, she received her uh, MD degree from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and her master's degree in general epidemiology from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public, Public Health. And she completed, completed her internal medicine residency followed by her medical oncology training here at Johns Hopkins before she moved on to Florida. We're happy to have her back. Her uh, primary area of interest is health disparities. So thank you, Dr. Lee. All right, thanks for having me. Um, so I just wanted to actually, let me just back out here. Um, just wanted to give a little bit of a background about me. I grew up in Jamaica. Um, I just always love to let people know that. Um, so on the right hand side, here's a picture of, um, or Duns River Falls. Do you um, have the slideshow before? It's like, mal it's like not showing up properly on the slideshow. So as okay, soon as sorry. I come up Go here, ahead, I'll back sorry. out up here. Um, and as, Karen said I spent 10 years in Baltimore and now sort of back to the beaches of, um, of Florida. Um, so I'm going to start with a little bit of an overview um, about how we treat breast cancer. Um, and I'm going to stay at a very high level because this does get to be a little bit of an alphabet soup. Um, so how we treat breast cancer depends on the type of breast cancer, and by type, I'm referring primarily to the receptors, that's the estrogen receptor, whether that's positive or negative, progesterone receptor, and the HER2 receptor. And we use chemotherapy, immunotherapy, targeted therapy, and hormonal therapy or endocrine therapy, as Dr. Hirschman just talked about. So I'll primarily be talking about chemotherapy and a little bit about that hormonal therapy today in terms of recognizing and managing side effects. So just to generally use both to treat um, people with early stage breast cancer as well as those with metastatic breast cancer. Um, most chemotherapy that we use in the realm of breast cancer um, are IV drugs, meaning that they go through the vein, um, but there are some oral drugs that we use as well. But they travel through the bloodstream and go throughout the entire body, and they attack cancer cells 
Um, and unfortunately, they also attack healthy and fast growing cells and that leads to a lot of the side effects that we see. So a lot of the management of chemotherapy side effects, it's a little bit of a balancing act, um, making sure that we treat cancer appropriately and also maintaining quality of life. Um, that's also going to have different decision making in terms of um, both thinking of it from the patient perspective and the provider perspective as to whether or not we're doing chemotherapy for a finite period of time for when we're treating early stage breast cancer, for example, and we know we just need to get through X number of chemotherapy regimens versus when we're talking about someone with an advanced breast cancer who may be on that chemotherapy regimen for a longer period of time. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is fatigue. Um, so fatigue can be particularly debilitating um, because it's this tiredness that may not go away with sleep. And I think one of the things that's hard about fatigue, it's sort of hard to measure, it's hard to show people, it's, a, it's something that patients feel. Um, and that kind of recognition of how much is normal versus abnormal and what to do and when to do can be difficult. Um, but once you're having fatigue um, that's interfering with your activities of daily living, um, big things that you can do to reduce the side effect um, of fatigue is number one, exercise. Exercise during chemotherapy does depend on kind of what's going on at the time and how much you can tolerate. It depends on how much you are doing before you started chemotherapy. So you do want to have that conversation with your oncologist to make sure that what you're doing is safe. Um, another big thing is sort of meeting your body where, um, where it is. So planning for breaks and naps during the day, if at all possible. And of course, healthy nutrition by eating well and drinking water. You know, I have asked for help here, and this is going to be a common theme as I move through these slides, because part of this whole symptom management piece, there's the part that as a patient and caregivers that happens at home, and then there's a part that your providers have to help. Um, sometimes a symptom may seem like this is just something that happens with chemotherapy, but sometimes it could be a sign of something more serious. And so notifying your provider of what's happening um, can not only help with um, getting tips and tricks for how to help reduce the side effect, but also to make sure that it's not a sign of something more serious that's going on. Um, so hair loss is the next thing I'd like to talk about. Um, so not all chemotherapy cause hair loss um, and hair does grow back after treatment is stopped. But, you know, hair loss is um, a big concern of women that are about to start chemotherapy. Um, one of the things that can be done to reduce um, the risk of hair loss are cooling caps. Um, now, um, I'm going to talk about two different things here. So when we talk about um, women with hair with kinks or coils um, and tight curls, um, there is the mix that uh, they in the literature, other styles, um, such as protective styles like braids and dreadlocks that might also limit the effectiveness of cooling or as to whether or not um, this is going to be a system that will work for you and how to optimize the utility of the system working for you. Um, if you do have hair loss or even if you do use cooling caps during chemotherapy, the scalp is still sensitive. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're caring for your scalp by washing it gently with gentle products you have to use sun protection on your scalp. So we're talking about another common side effect that we see with chemotherapy, particularly from drugs that we use like Taxotere or Taxol. Um, so this can manifest by sensations. There's lots of different ways it can feel like. So it could be numbness or tingling or burning or a pins and needles sensation, um, but it's some sort of altered sensation 
And if you have other medical conditions that can also cause damage to nerves or neuropathy, like diabetes, for example, that would put you at increased risk. Um, if you have neuropathy before you start chemotherapy that causes neuropathy, that might also make the neuropathy worse. And um, so there are um, no great ways to prevent this type of um, nerve damage when you're having chemotherapy in terms of um, using medicine. Um, using cooling similarly, to, um, it's kind of similar technology to the cooling caps to reduce the risk of hair loss, so cooling the hands and the feet. Um, that can be considered. Um, that um, there's also very limited data as to the efficacy, meaning how well this works to reduce the, the chances of neuropathy um, will allow for cooling of the hands and feet during chemotherapy. So that's something that you have to discuss with your doctor. Um, as always, early recognition is important, and that's because the nerve damage that happened can get worse over time as you get more of that same chemotherapy. And so if you sort of start with uh, numbness and tingling that's sort of coming and going, and as you're getting more and more chemotherapy, those nerves could get more damaged. Um, and the damage could be more permanent if that's not brought to the attention of your care team. If you do develop neuropathy, um, then you can use medications to help with the symptoms of the neuropathy. Um, so we're talking about whatever pain sensations or altered sensations, those medications are usually in the family of um, antidepressants or medications like gabapentin that we also use um, to treat like the neuropathy that comes from diabetes. Um, acupuncture um, can also help um, to, to reduce the, the feeling and the sensation that comes from neuropathy. All right, so Dr. Hirschman talked about um, endocrine therapy, so I'm going to go through a lot of this. Um, but I did want to talk about the impact of cancer treatment on um, dating, sex, and reproduction, um, particularly um, reproduction um, and sort of focusing on the psychosocial um, parts of, um, of what it means to go through uh, cancer treatment. Um, so whether it's um, surgery or radiation or chemotherapy, having a breast cancer diagnosis um, and having um, any sort of cancer treatment can have a profound impact on one's body image, one's self, um, sense of self, um, one's sense of um, sexuality, um, in addition to ch changes in um, libido um, and that can all impact. Um, so I think one of the um, one of the big things to sort of help with those changes um, in terms of again the body image more so is to think about therapy. So the role of psychotherapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, sex therapy for those that are in a relationship, couples therapy can also. Both people in that cancer treatment is like and how it sort of shapes um, that cancer survivor or metaviver moving forward. This is something, especially in the context of chemotherapy, um, that does need to happen prior to initiation. And so um, ideally, this is something that would be discussed um, before um, you start chemotherapy. Therapy. Um, and, you know, if the timing allows being able to save, um, to save fertility. And then I think the other big question is then when and if um, you can become pregnant for women um, moving forward after a breast cancer diagnosis. And that's going to depend a lot on the specific circumstances about um, your cancer and sort of where you are when you're ready to have get, to get pregnant. Um, and again, that's something that can be discussed with your oncologist. So this slide is just to say that chemotherapy and a lot of our cancer treatments affects the entire body. 
And so a lot of times, you know, you have your oncologist and your breast cancer doctor, your primary care doctor, and often supportive care or palliative care as sort of the center of the cancer care treatment team. But a lot of times um, we need additional help um, from other subspecialists depending on the specific side effects that are happening. And so I've just listed a few here. Um, but it's important to note that this can get overwhelming, especially if there are a number of different um, specialists involved. Um, and I think sometimes there is, um, there can be a sense of, you know, why do I need all of these different doctors? It's all of these different appointments or all of these different specialists. Um, but keep in mind that the body is, is very, it's a complicated system. Um, and sometimes it's just trying to get a plan in place um, that your kind of core cancer team can sort of help to manage moving forward and hopefully um, you know those appointments in terms of frequency will um, decrease over time. So I wanted to um, speak a little bit about health disparities particularly in the context of symptom management. Um, so when we talk about symptoms, we talk about fatigue, for example, I sort of mentioned that, you know, this is a symptom that there's no objective way, um, uh, there's no great objective way to measure fatigue, for example, a lot of the side effects that we're talking about, there's no objective way, there's no blood test that you take um, for your doctor to say, oh yes, you are fatigued. Um, so um, their symptoms to the provider. Providers um, are here to help and it's not um, it's not uh, want to hurt anyone but we all have conscious and unconscious biases that can lead to stereotypes have this um, a subjectivity or a personal personal spin on how you interpret you know what someone's saying to you and that interpretation um, with combined with the fact that how we treat a lot of these side effects as Dr. Hirschman and very nicely um, laid out when it comes to treating the But put all of that together, that's how sometimes you can end up with high socioeconomic status. Um, so I want to point out that I 100% acknowledge and I am not in any way saying that the burden for reducing healthcare disparities is on the patient. That is not the case at all. Um, there's a lot of great work that's going on to try to understand um, why we have um, ongoing health disparities when it comes to breast cancer outcomes. Um, and the point of this slide is really to help a caregiver, a black woman, or any other um, health disparity population. As team, as you meet with your team and sort of start to move through that system, making sure it's a team that you feel that you can trust and that you feel comfortable with. And then, you know, you have to have that support network and whether that's, you know, having somebody on the phone with you when you're an appointment someone so always communication. Um, here are some steps sort of in between visits. You want to make a list of your concerns. Um, doesn't matter how long that list is, but then you want to make sure that you prioritize your concerns. And then it's always nice if you could actually have that list in such a way that you can share with your provider. But if you have it for yourself, 
read to them, that's also fine. You want to make sure that you speak up in your visit. A lot of visits are a short time span and you want to make sure that your concerns are um, addressed and reported early in the visit. And then you have to, to listen and make sure that you're getting the information that you need. And so whether that's writing it down or recording it or having that friend, caregiver, advocate, someone with you to make sure that you, you kind of hear everything that's said um, so that you can sort of process after. Um, ask questions. And then I think last of all, you know, try not to minimize um, sometimes there can be concerns about not wanting to be a problem patient or not wanting um, to have any changes because what you're, of what you're saying. But you really, again, if you have that trust to describe what's happening, that you and your doctor can partner. You know, Cancer.net um, and the American Cancer Society, I think, have some really nice resources. And, and in my reading, um, I found particularly useful in just thinking about um, not only short-term side effects of, of treatment, which is what I've mostly talked about today, but sort of the long-term um, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, I'm glad you ended on the note of uh, patient stories, because that's where we're going to turn to now. Um, I'm going to ask Elizabeth Saylor, our breast cancer navigator, to introduce uh, Melissa Preston Wesby, our uh, uh, breast cancer patient, who's going to share her story. Um, just a reminder while they're preparing and Melissa is sharing her experience, um, feel free to put any questions in the uh, QA. Um, and when she finishes, we're going to have a, a question and answer session. Um, there's only one question that's there so far, and so hopefully there will be some more, but no worries if there aren't, because I have some. <laughs> so. <laughs> Hi, so as Karen said, um, or Dr. Smith said, I'm Elizabeth Saylor, and I'm a member of the Breast Cancer Program's patient navigation team. And it's, it is my privilege to introduce our patient voice speaker, Melissa Preston Wesby. Melissa has kindly agreed to share the firsthand patient perspective of life as a breast cancer survivor, diagnosed at 30 with stage 3A ERPR positive HER2 negative breast cancer. This may, I think if I have it right, you celebrated five years of survivorship. Mm -hmm. She knows a lot about potential and experienced side effects. She's gracefully endured the majority of treatment options that we have for patients, including chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, and now endocrine therapy. And for me, one of the most rewarding aspects of getting to know someone through patient navigation and then having the good fortune to introduce her as a survivor speaker in a forum like this is that I get the opportunity to learn more about a woman beyond her breast cancer, what makes her tick, what motivates her, who she is as a person. This means I also learn, and you guys will learn in a second, about the context within which side effects from treatment are experienced and how the burden of side effects can impact a life and many lives. Um, if a patient like Melissa is a mom and a wife and a nurse, so many, many different people can be impacted by our treatments. She got her start in New Orleans, Louisiana, a city that knows a lot about adversity and what it takes to come back from really challenging circumstances. And for her first bachelor's degree, she went a little bit north to Baton Rouge and she studied animal, dairy, and poultry science at Louisiana State University. So LSU has very many famous alums, including Shaquille O'Neal, Donna Brazil, Don Lemon of CNN, and of course, Melissa. I know a little bit more about her fame. <laughs> so after LSU, Melissa returned to her hometown of New Orleans, and she studied nursing at the Charity School of Nursing, receiving her associate's degree there right around the time of Hurricane Katrina. And the campus where she studied was one block from the Superdome, and it was inundated by water and wind. And she shared with me that she and her fellow students were given the opportunity to graduate from different schools and finish up their degrees, but they stayed 
um, and chose to graduate from charity. As she tells it, she followed love in the form of her husband to the East Coast, and she took a job at Johns Hopkins, earning another bachelor's degree, this one a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Notre Dame Mar of Maryland University. And she's put all of her education, talent, and compassion for others to good use as a nurse for, I believe you said 15 years? Mm -hmm. 15 mm -hmm. years at our Johns Hopkins Baby Medical Center. She's a wife, a mother of three. She and her husband live in Baltimore City where her three kids attend Patterson Park Public Charter School. And her husband's a television producer for BET and their family business, Wesby One Productions. Now, as I mentioned before, she is a little bit famous. She's <laughs> shy about tooting her own horn. <laughs> But when our vice president, Kamala Harris, came to Baltimore City in April 2021 to tour our mass uh, COVID vaccination center at M&T Bank Stadium, Melissa was selected to introduce Vice President Harris. Right. Melissa was open and honest with the listeners gathered to see the vice president, and she shared that even as a very experienced nurse and a breast cancer survivor, she struggled with seeing cor coronavirus patients suffer alone in the hospital. And Vice President Harris opened her remarks, thanking Melissa as an example of how crises produce heroes among us. So now Melissa is going to share with you her cancer journey, how practicing yoga and jogging regularly helps her to deal with her current side effects and some of the ones she went through previously and maintain her mental health. So thank you so much, <laughs> Melissa, for being with us. That was so beautiful. Oh. <laughs> well, you have a great story. There you go. Um, Hello. So I am all of your slides. All of your slides. It's, it's me. <laughs> it's me every day, all day. So I was instructed to talk about the side effects that I um, go through and how I deal with them. Um, so diagnosed in 2000, keep this way. Diagnosed in 2017 at 38. Um, it was the the brick wall, as my mom says, the brick wall have to hit you before you make changes. I was living living my, my usual life, not sleeping well, not eating right, um, just all the things a mother, wife, you do. So when I got hit by the brick, the brick wall, I made some changes. So in speaking to side effects, we always talk about the negatives. There are negatives, and I am the slide. However, I've had so much positive happen um, as far as side effects um, due to breast cancer. So this brick wall hit me, and so I made life changes. I'm eating better. I'm exercising. I don't care as much about the things that used to bother me. Um, just a different, whole different perspective on life right now. Um, but keeping with the... The, the topic with the side effects, you know, going going back to when I had my mastectomy, I also said you a bilateral mastectomy. And I can remember Dr. Camp telling me, Melissa, you have to make sure you take it easy. You have to make sure that you rest. You have to make sure that you take your medicines, just chill out. So living the life that I was prior to the brick wall, but I realized, okay, I'm, I'm going to do what the doctor says. So do what the doctor says, I can ward off these side effects. So in speaking of health and use your community, I asked my family to take my kids. So my, my family in Louisiana took my kids after my mastectomy. So I was able to sit on the couch and watch Game of Thrones, take my medications, <laughs> and relax. And I had radiation. Um, um, Dr. Alcorn, um, make sure you rest, pull all the cream. So I did all the creams, did my range of motion. My kids will go. Radiation um, killed your skin, basically. It was terrible. It was awful. Skin was peeling. It was not attractive. Um, I'm sleeping with A and D ointment on top of a towel. It was just madness. 
Um, but I put the creams on, I did all the things to water off those side effects. I did it great. Um, moving further along, when I had my recon reconstruction number one, um, Dr. Manahan, rest, range of motion, do all the things. Okay, Dr. Manahan, I'm going to do just that. Um, now realizing I have, I have been blessed with a career that offers me time off. And when you think about disparities, I was able to take time off. I was able to send my kids away. My husband was preparing meals. So I was able to do other things that the, that the doctors asked of me. Um, but did the reconstruction surgery, I rested and everything turned out well. I didn't have any pain. Side effects were taken care of. And then when it finally came to my medical oncologist, again, Dr. Wolf said to me, I remember very clearly, he said, Melissa, you're a young woman. And if you can move five times a week, you can ward off some of these side effects. So, okay, Dr. Wolf, I'm going to move five times a week. So I'm resting, I'm doing all the creams, the nurse is telling me to massage the, the incision site, I'm doing all the things. And so after all of this, I feel like my outcome has been a beautiful one. It has honestly been a transformation. Breast cancer diagnosis was terrible and it's crap, but I moved, I moved on with like, I've accepted it. I've accepted that this is what it is. This is the new me. This is the life I have lived. So I'm, I'm doing the range of motion. I'm doing the physical therapy. I'm doing all things that the doctor said. And it has been a beautiful, a beautiful situation for me. I, Cancer sucks, but if I think about my life prior to it, I feel like I'm in, the, in a better space. Um, I want to say that there were so many things that you all put into the slides that just spoke to me, especially about communicating with the doctors. I feel like I send my chart messages all the time, and yes, it may be a nuisance, but I don't care <laughs> because I get the responses that I need. Um, if there's something I need, I can message um, Elizabeth or Jill, um, and they respond back to me. They put me in touch with uh, peer groups. I remember going to one with a, a dermatologist, um, and I learned so much about what I could do with my skin post-radiation. Uh, um, I remember doing some webinars with sex therapists, which we also don't talk about a lot, but you guys talk about it a lot here, and I'm so happy because sex is a thing, especially for young, young breast cancer um, people. Oh, I mean, I'm married. I have a young husband. So we have to get creative. Like, to be perfectly honest, I have to be creative. Um, I didn't see anywhere in any of this. Holistic approaches to, um, to uh, dermatologists that wanted the web. No, I mean, that Jill and Elizabeth set up. And coconut oil changed my life. It changed his life. <laughs> so yes. talking about sex, and it's, it's real. It's, it's important. Um, and just, you know, um, being a big role in a woman, Melissa, that I am. Um, I know I'm going all over the place, but I'm trying to keep with the side effects and how I'm managing. So... In order to move five times a week, as Dr. Wolf uh, told me and the nurses told me and all of the doctors told me, had to figure out how I was going to do that. So using my support group, I started taking yoga classes. Now, I, I can't do all the yoga poses and I'm not super flexible, but it was fun and I enjoyed it and it made me feel good. And it kept my, I never had a problem with it was, was the thing for me. Um, I started jogging. I'm not jogging to run a race. I watch reality TV as I jog, but I'm moving. I'm moving my five times a week, if not more. Um, today, even, even today, I took a walk in the park, just listened to a book. That's it. I walked my kids to school. I did two laps in the park, and then I went home. That was just something to keep moving because it works. Now, if there's a slump and I don't move, and I don't do those things. I can feel it. I can feel all the things happening. And I 
and I can feel my, I can feel my, my I can hear my knees, um, almost like cracking, like, so start, I just gotta, you gotta do it, like, it's mind over matter, um, I'm fortunate enough to have a husband that does all of the cooking, so, Um, I did eliminate a few things in my diet, but that was just like that. I didn't want to dwell too much on the negative because it's always negative. When you, when you think of cancer, you think of the fatigue, you think of the hair loss, you think of just someone frail. And I don't feel like I'm frail. I feel like I'm, I'm a, a great positive spirit and so much great has come from it. This, I'm being asked to be to speak here. I met the, the, the vice president, you know, going to the White House. All of this is because of brand, breast cancer. Um, so it, it wasn't, it hasn't been to my detriment. It has been a transformation it, and I'm still transformed. And I think it has made me a better person today. I'm just going to eyeball my notes to make sure I didn't leave anything out. Uh, something I wrote on here is saying using my PTO prior to breast cancer, I was always saving my PTO, this paid time off, saving it, saving it, saving it for a trip here, saving it for trip there to do something but now post breast cancer I need my wellness days I just need a day or two <laughs> to to reset to sometimes not do anything and I you know I'm not guaranteed I'm, I don't know how long I'm gonna be here so let me use my PTO so I, I had to put that in here because I there was I didn't realize that I needed time to just do nothing I needed some time to just be and I, I do that now um and I think I might have all my little notes here because it was just 10 minutes, I think, right? I think that is all that I have on here to say. I didn't go into the story as much because I'm long-winded and I could say a whole bunch of, of other stuff. I think that was plenty and thank that was you okay. so much. <laughs> and uh, it's just amazing. Number one, with regard to side effects, how you showed us that they can be mitigated and yes. by things that you do yourself a lot of the time and just that how this has been a transformative experience for you. Thank Absolutely. you so much for sharing. Um, I'm going to invite you guys to come a little closer to the table. Our other two speakers, if you guys can come up, we have um, just about 10 more minutes. And um, there's a couple of questions that have come through the chat. And if others have any more, uh, please uh, feel free to ask. Um, the first one I'm going to pose to either Dr. Hirschman or Dr. Lee um, relates to the issue of how an aromatase inhibitor, one of the hormonal types of medications that's often prescribed, um, can affect the cholesterol or the blood uh, lipid level. Uh, the person who posed the question noted that uh, her cholesterol had gone up 50 points after she'd been on letrozole, one of the aromatase inhibitors, for just about 10 months. Um, so if you guys are able to speak to whether that's a recognized side effect, and if so, what should we be monitoring for, and how should we treat it, what, what is there, what's the data about that? Um, oh, did you want to? Oh, okay. So, so it, um, yeah, so it's a great question. The cholesterol definitely can change um, when you lower estrogen levels, and the aromatase inhibitors lower estrogen levels. Sometimes when you're on these medicines, you've just been through menopause too, or you're on a medicine that's suppressing your ovaries, so it can be like a double whammy, so to speak, in terms of what it can do to your whole metabolic system. And sometimes all of those changes and chemotherapy and everything else can cause you to gain weight which can then be like a triple whammy in terms of what it does to your, to your cholesterol. One of the things that's really important is that um, your total cholesterol can change. It's, it's important to look at the different components. Um, the, the biggest effect of the um, aromatase inhibitors is actually on triglycerides. So it may not be all the different components. So it's something where you don't always want to just look at the total, but you want to talk to your primary care doctor about doing a fasting test 
and looking at the different components. Is it that your LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, did that go up? Did your triglycerides go up? Did your HDL go down? Like what happened to it? Because how you might treat it may be different depending on what those changes actually were. And it brings up a really important point about the marriage between your oncologist and your primary care doctor, because we know and we've seen that when somebody's diagnosed with breast cancer, it has such a huge impact on their whole life, like mm -hmm. you such so beautifully um, told us about. But sometimes you focus so much on that that you forget that you have wherever it is that you don't ignore all those other your blood pressure, your cholesterol, because those also are really important for, for living a long, healthy life. So we recommend like maintaining your weight and exercising can all be good both for your breast cancer, but also for some of those other, other components. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll pose the next question to you, Dr. Lee. There's a question about um, uh, other options regarding, besides coconut oil, in terms of managing uh, <coughs> vaginal dryness and uh, discomfort during sexual activity, and what are, what are the other choices for that? Yeah, so um, another holistic option that I talk about um, is uh, vitamin E. Um, so the vitamin E capsules, both as um, lubrication for sex, as well as, as a vaginal moisturizer. Um, and I'll maybe take a little bit and talk about the difference between using a lubricant for, um, for penetration during sex versus a moisturizer. Um, so a moisturizer is something that you would use, you know, two or three times a week. Um, sort of just like moisturizing the face, you would moisturize um, the, the opening of the vagina. And you could do that with something like coconut oil or the vitamin E capsules or the other medications that were mentioned like replens. And the idea is that with the change in the estrogen levels, the vaginal tissue is dry. And so it's not just replacing that lubrication during sexual intercourse, but trying to maintain that lubrication at all times. Thank you. And, and actually, there's new, newer products that are out that are not estrogen-based that are, have something in it called hyaluronic acid-based um, uh, creams. Uh, one of them is Reverie. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get them actually on Amazon. Um, and they also can be effective and safe. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a, there's lots of options. Maybe um, can you talk about your approach? Do you start with these kinds of options or when, when or do you ever uh, use the vaginal estrogen? You showed those slides about how there might, at least in some people, be a little bit of absorption. So how do you, how do you pick? There's a whole bunch of things that, that are options. Um, so I, in my practice, um, I usually start with uh, moisturizers and lubricant does with time. Um, sometimes there is a little bit of um, an adjustment period for the body um, as after starting these drugs, especially if there's been chemotherapy. Um, and then if we're doing, for example, ovarian suppression, it's like it can be a huge shock to the body. And sometimes the body does adjust a little um, even though the symptoms might be quite um, rough in the beginning. Um, when I might use um, vaginal estrogen, something like Vagifem, um, is if the symptoms are significantly impacting someone's quality of life. So I really do have these conversations about sex and trying to understand um, how much of it is physical pain with penetration versus how much is um, changes in libido and really understand what the issue is because you can't treat, you know, changes in libido if someone doesn't want to have sex because they don't feel like having sex. You can't really 
fix that with vaginal estrogen necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I try to understand what the underlying issue is. But the, if the issue really is painful sex from vaginal dryness and nothing else we have tried has worked in terms of any of the moisturizers or lubricants, um, then I do have a conversation with patients about using vaginal estrogens and this idea of, you know, this theoretical risk of there could be some systemic absorption of estrogen. Um, but, you know, if you're thinking about discontinuing the drug altogether, um, especially for early on in treatment, right? If that's where we're at, um, then I think using a vaginal estrogen to maintain quality of life so that we can continue treating breast cancer is worth it. And sometimes it, even if you do it for a short period of time and then taper off, it can also be effective. So it doesn't mean that, you know, somebody needs to be on it forever. I agree. I think you raised a couple of really important points there about the the trying it for a period of time, um, and then also just the need to talk to your doctor about these kinds of side effects. And sometimes it's very uncomfortable for women to bring up sex and vaginal dryness and things. And sometimes it's uncomfortable for the doctor and the doctor might not want to bring it up. So I think just a shout out to everyone to bring it up. If you have doctors and nurses and patients alike, it really, if it's a problem, you need to talk about it. Um, I'm going to switch to a totally different topic. We've got a question about a group of drugs called uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors, um, cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors. Um, the question specifically related to one of those drugs called ribocyclin. Uh, these are drugs that are most often used for women who have metastatic breast cancer in conjunction with hormonal therapy. Um, although we sometimes use one of the drugs in this class of venocyclin for women who have earlier stage breast cancer. Uh, the question really was just to describe side effects associated with ribocyclin and how best to manage them. Either of you can take it. <laughs> I mean, um, it's, it's a really good question because that's where taking all these medicines become complicated because, you know, as you point out, you have to deal with all of those endocrine potential side effects. And then our treatments have started to get more and more complicated. We add in CDK4-6 inhibitors like ribocyclib, and maybe we add in other drugs on top of it, or, you know, immunotherapy or some other thing on top of each thing, it starts to ratchet it up a ladder. So all of that class that you mentioned, there are three different drugs, and they're all slightly different with all slightly different side 